So what is the difference between a substance and a thing? Both have ontological unity. Both have tangible presences in the archaeological record. Is it simply a question of scale, complexity, or agency that transforms our understanding of the, of the material from a substance to a thing? The more elaborate and complex the capabilities, affordances, and agencies of the substance, the more thing-like it appears. Persons and things consist of substances, and it is the congealing and forming of the latter that allow both human and material agencies to flow. In the discourse of materialisms and following on from the establishment of material agency, should substances be deemed quasi-agents? Or is the substance the ultimate substratum, a metaphysical realm on which we fix our contingent sense of the world? If the agency of the substance is potently and exclusively expressed through the repercussions it has on a human body, how accurate is the life-matter binary? If those on either side of the binary are in the throes of co-creation. During this paper, I examine a human interacting with a substance in a bid to understand the relationship in flow and to reveal some of the difficulties vital materialists are faced with when attempting to frame and understand the role of vibrant matter. Anthropological research conducted with performance artist Suze Adams presents a case study for the dispersal of self and becomes an opportunity to consider the stratification and social formation of the body under the auspices of Deleuze and Guattari's outline of the body without organs. It is through the exploration of these ideas and actions that the paper arrives at a burial context at the Neolithic town Chatelhoyuk, where the residues of carbon are located on the vertebrae and ribs of an individual. The, vitalities, the vitality of these substances and their appearance in the archaeological record confronts the life matter binary which I reframe with some reference to Karen Barrett's The Gentral Realist Approach as co-creation. Following the recent rebirth of the notion of the vital, vitality, to quote Jane Bennett, has been successful, well, I'm adding this, has been successfully reclaimed from the figures of passive, mechanistic, or divinely infused substance. The vibrant matter is not the raw material for the creative activity of humans or God. It is my body but also the bodies of Baltimore litter. Through the clear location and theorisation of a vitality intrinsic to materiality, Bennett asserts a type of vitality that finally allows conceptual <coughs> space for the capacity of things. Bennett. Ed edibles, com commodities, storms, metals, not only to impede or block the will and designs of humans, but also to act as quasi-agents or forces with trajectories, propensities, or tendencies of their own. We need only take a brief jaunt through the realms of psychopharmacology to understand the dramatic effects that psychedelic substances can have on humans. It is the immediacy and transformatory nature of these substances that induce effects on their human hosts that situates these particular substances at the extreme end of a spectrum of vital materials. Building on this point, let us consider the vital materials whose potency similarly grows proportionately with their accumulation, such as oil spills, tumours, or, for the particular purpose of this paper, smoke in the lungs. Smoke is a vital material, from the toxicity of the smoke produced from burnt plastic to the toxic pollutants produced by wood, burning wood, from culturally contingent responses to the aesthetics of smoke, such as the appearance of white smoke during conclave, the physical impairment caused by cigarettes, such as emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Not all smoke is equal. Daily collaborations with smoke inform the day-to-day -day workings and movement of human bodies who coexist in the same space. Smoke can be damaging for human agents, particularly when routinely inhaled in small enclosed buildings. I've got an example of the experimental house at Chatelhoyuk here. It's a mud brick building during the Neolithic. Okay, archaeologist Matthew Fitzjohn, who's here, not in this room but at the conference, discusses air pollution in mud brick buildings and provides an in depth discussion of potential illnesses de developed from exposure to the pollution in the home. He offers a, di a disease demography that interweaves cooking at the hearth and the likelihood of disease. Even organic fuels like animal dung or wood can cause problematic air pollution, and through the analysis of middens and hearths, both inside and outside of buildings at the Neolithic town Chatelhoyuk, it has been established that these were the two major fuel sources at the town. 
To explain the impact burning this type of fuel in domestic buildings has on individuals, Fitzjohn highlights experimental archaeology, archaeological research carried out at Lejeune, which reconstructed two Iron Age longhouses. Fitzjohn notes that through the houses, though the houses were ventilated, they were still very smoky and irritated the participants' eyes and their respiratory systems. Analysis of, analysis of the air quality inside the building revealed that over the course of the one week, dangerously high levels of various toxic pollutants that, that were derived from the wood smoke were recorded. The fact that archaeologists now detect lung damage from the analysis of carbon present on bones indicates how deeply these vital materials penetrated Neolithic human bodies. Smoke is a difficult substance for humans, dries the eyes and causes them to water, and when we inhale smoke we tend to cough. Smoke inhalation was part of daily life at the Neolithic town, and evidence of the damage caused due to engagement with this vital material has been found in the lungs of inhabitants. Andrew Zetal explained that during life, smoke accumulates in the lungs, and then as the lungs decay after death, the residues deposit on the ribs and vertebrae. The cacophony of coughing as residents entered and left the building, or as they went to sleep at night, can only be imagined. Coughing is a reflex action and can be, directly, can be linked to the residues of smoke in the lungs after a day of inhalation. In response to the smoke, the body produces phlegm, lung capacity is reduced, which can cause wheezing, and there is an increased risk of respiratory infections. Therefore, if the body co-creates with smoke over a period of time, it can become susceptible to, or perhaps more accessible for, bacterial agents, depending on when, whether the perspective is human or bacteria. So the vitality of the smoke as an agent is important to recognise in the discussion of vital materialisms active in the building, especially when trying to understand how these agents inform the experience of space. The prox these proximal agents are taken within and held intimately in the lungs. These are the its that challenge the onto foundations that ideas like you and I rest, the idea that we are unique entities. For the vital materialists amongst us, the colonies of bacteria, to give one of Bennett's examples, uh, that moisten the skin on the elbow, allowing for the ease of movement, are not of accidental or incidental importance, but make a certain way of moving, as a human, easier. These are essential collaborations. These are bodies that co-create. During the next section, I shall introduce some primary research I conducted with performance artist Suze Adams in a bid to experiment with these collaborations. And this is all about bodies that co-create. This is um, Suze Adams. For the 2016 Fringe Arts Bath exhibition, British artist Suze Adams created a performed residency at the Cartesian Cut exhibition. Her piece, called At One Remove, involved the artist occupying the window area of the exhibition and spending the day working and becoming, not being, in the space. After one week in the window, Adams removed her physical self from the performance space and left her work and things on show for the remainder of the exhibition. As the last few days of the exhibition passed, cups of orange juice gathered green mould and slowly exuded pungent scent. Adams's flowers wilted, their petals collapsing onto her beloved desk, the bin by her desk remained full. Therefore, the window spotlighted a host of organic and social processes, some in full flow, others stunted, by the transition of the space from shop to exhibition, from bin to artwork. Her work table betrayed clues to the cognitive explorations she had conducted during her performance. Olive stones and drawings of olive stones, quotes and crumbled up pieces of paper containing unwanted or redundant ideas metonymic devices such as a dental x-ray and an envelope containing with highlighted words offered the audience access points to the artist's subject of inquiry. What was not left on show were the products of what became the most distinctive moment of the whole performance, an action that Adams would later refer to as the dirt moment. This was when Adams got onto her knees and rubbed two pieces of paper on the floor at the end of her occupation, and by doing so created abstract drawings co-created by the artist and collective dirt. Adams describes all the materials on show at the site of her performance as traces. These are her remnants and residues of her activities. She sees the assemblage of things as a dispersal of self, and the performance is capturing a body in transit. Adams describes the objects at her desk as appendages, the artist perceives the chair, pencils, olive stones and books are still attached to her being. 
Through her interaction with the dirt, Adams had created a further appendage, a portable device that had <coughs> modifiable potential, a drawing. The transformation of substance to material reframed the dirt as thing and offered insight into a specific material trajectory. The transition brings into focus the notion of appendage vis-à-vis -vis remnant or residue. The remnants and residues of Adams' activities in the window were, according to the artist, traces and not appendages. And these traces were an aggregate of collective matter. As aggregate... Hmm. As not all the substances used in the dirt drawing were her own, but inevitably the residues of other proximal agents. Adams's use of the term remnants to describe the substances indicates both the loss and separation between the body and body parts. She describes these substances as excess and refuse, the things we don't need. Through inter interaction with the artist, the substance on the floor are transformed into a drawing and in the process transforms substance to thing. So, through human intervention, the dirt is perceived as a raw material that is used to make art. However, in this interpretation, the substance agents are once again subdued and colonised by the narrative of human exceptionalism. By this, I mean that the central role of the human in the transformation process sustains an anthropocentric model of material interactions that reiterates the vitalist dance Bennett inverts during her discussion of vibrant matter. The new materialism's discourse demands that we move beyond this narrative. Therefore, it's not enough to simply focus on describing or observing the ontological categories of the materials. There is also a reason to examine the doings in this particular event. So, dirt. Within the archaeological discourse, the dirty, clean binary has been used by Ian Hodder in his analysis of buildings at Chattel Hoyoke. The northern areas of the internal spaces, according to micro-artifactual analysis, tend to be cleaner unlike the dirty, dirtier southern areas near the hearth and rooftop entry point to the building. Invariably, at the entry point of any building, the footfall will be more pronounced, and as cooking also takes place here, as the hearth is situated under the rooftop entry point to allow smoke to be released, there would be more activities around this area, hence more bodily residues and traces of living, aka dirt. These traces are reflective of busyness, activities, put simply, this is footfall. In his recent self-published text, Hodder extends the clean, dirty binary to the surfaces of pottery in a bid to understand the surprising practice at Chattel Hoyok of producing undecorated cooking pottery, which, despite being initially burnished, remains plain. Hodder argues the lack of decoration fits into a wider set of practices that distinguishes the plain, dirty southern areas of the main rooms from the northern, clean and ritually marked and decorated areas. This argument seems a step too far and begs the question, what is dirt and how universal is the concept of dirt? The point of consideration is whether the concept of dirt and the separation between humans and their material traces, those coagulations that Adams pressed and rubbed on the paper, are, are part of a socially informed organisation process that allows for the body to remain carefully stratified. For further, um, few humans organise this minutia. Thus, these residues are abandoned and shunned through the notion of dirt. Anthropologist Mary Douglas notes that reflection on dirt involves reflection on order to disorder, being to non-being, form to formlessness. In Purity and Danger, she indicates that the notion of, notions of dirt are culturally configured, particularly when she observes that communities who have been influenced and shaped by 19th century advancements in bacteriology have an understanding of dirt that is dominated by the knowledge of pathogenic organisms. But we might also consider Deleuze and Guattari's work on the body without organs. Human skin is an organ in its own right. It renews and sheds like nails and hair. And these sedimentations are forfeited and lost to the earth, air, and so on. If we glanced at the window floor and examined the residues, are these the alluvians that Deleuze and Guattari speak of, deposits left by the flowing body? And are these alluvians part of the sedimentation process that allows the body to remain stratified? For by forming a blockage between the organism and its its, by classing the its as dirt, the body remains organised. I suspect these deposits are stratum. They are the accumulation and sedimentation of the body without organs. And reflecting on Adams's work, it seems reasonable to suggest that the window dirt was integral to the artwork due to the central role in the event. 
Its presence beckoned to the artist and caused action. These drawings could not exist without the coagulations of these sedimentations, these cap their capabilities, marking paper, creating rhythms with human hand. I argue that from the perspective of vital materialists, during the context of the performance, the dirt could be considered a co-creator. This notion is much easier to accept if we take on Karen Barrett's agential realist position, which disputes the Cartesian cut and states that things as unique entities do not exist, as things are always in phenomena. Thus, the artists and collective matter in the context are in phenomena. Like the smoke in the lungs of the resident at Chateau Hoyac, these vital materials are bodies that co-create. <coughs> to conclude, I argue we do not simply host these substances or form these substances, these vital materials, but co-create with them. Thus, these proximal quasi-agents that exist in polluted air become key agents, debilitating agents, when nestled in the lungs. They make us co-creating, co-producing, co-constituting life matter. Equally, how separate are the remnants and residues of our bodily traces? Is their discrete status simply a byproduct of a, sim of a social formation process that ensures the body remains whole and organised? The following quote from Bennett is at the heart of this paper. It is an, an oxymoronic truism that the human is not exclusively human, that we are made up of its. Within archaeology, how we tackle and take forward the life matter predicament is a new and exciting realm for theoretical archaeology with great potential for future archaeological interpretation. Deeming dirt in terms of a binary is no longer sufficient. Deeming smoke an incidental byproduct no longer exact. Thank you.